it's a pleasure to represent the Technology Committee and uh, a huge thank you to everybody who's participated in that. Uh, part of my uh, background is that I began as a clinician in the United States Navy, so I had the chance to work with patients, and for me, meds is medications. Um, so admittedly, as I came into the Medicaid program and Medi-Cal and then got introduced to meds, the Medi-Cal eligibility data system, it was a little bit of a, a language uh, twist. And so that's one of the things that we have been trying to emphasize throughout all of these symposia, um, and one of the things that definitely came up at the first one is the problem of acronyms. We all do alphabet soup very well, but even, even the wonderful initials CMS at the last uh, symposium, we found out had at least three different definitions and I don't know what they all were. But it's not Center for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services for everyone, just in my world. Um, so the, the initials and the acronyms we're trying to avoid. Um, and as we had the technology conversation, one of the things we kept emphasizing as well was avoid the name of the system, avoid the term, and keep, keep focused on what do you need for what reason. And we've heard that in all of the other presentations as well. What do you need for what reason so that we get the right information to the right person at the right time. Um, and then we'll worry about the systems and the technology on the back end, but we really need help understanding what you need, for who, and when. So as we go through this, um, that'll be a theme as you, as you hear. So again, first of all, I'd really like to do a shout out. And everybody who's here from the Technology Committee, if you could stand up, that's here in the room. And, and for all of you on the Technology Committee that have only heard each other's voices, now you know who to go look for. Um, so really a huge thank you to everyone. We had a, a terrific uh, uh, participation at both the county and the state level, um, which was very, very valuable. And uh, the names are listed here, uh, but, and we had a huge amount of staff support. And, and also in this piece, I'd really like to thank Valerie Barnes. Um, and for everybody who doesn't know her, she's up here. Um, she really made a lot of this happen. She took these ideas that we talked about, found the references, put it together, and then gave us something to respond to. So she was a huge part of this. Yes. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about the objectives that we started with, the process that we went through over the summer, uh, the outcomes, and then our recommendations. And so as a committee, we ended up with about, I think it was nine recommendations total. Uh, and for each of those, we took a look at what might we do in the next six months, in the six to twelve, tw six months to two years and the more than two years. Um, so we did that for each of these sets of recommendations um, and we'll, we'll go through those. But first we wanted to start off with, again, what our objectives were. So the committee was tasked to develop technology-related recommendations for the state plan with a focus on enterprise architecture, IT initiatives to be leveraged for interoperability, and identifying top priorities for data sharing within programs under the Health and Human Services. And really we wanted to emphasize that we see this as, as the uh, Health and Human Services including state and county partnerships because as was said earlier, uh, it is a team effort and we don't, either one of us, work independently of each other without a dependency. So um, as we looked at this, we very much were aware of what was that uh, intersection. So the process that we used. One of the advantages we had for the technology uh, committee was that we really had um, some nice frameworks to start with. Um, so because of that, uh, we started off actually by having some educational sessions that talked about those frameworks, uh, two of those being the National Human Services Information Architecture. Did I get right? Interoperability architecture, sorry. Okay, I'm obviously on the other framework on, on my day job. Um, uh, so there's the National Human Services Interoperability Architecture, and then there's the Medicaid Information Technology Architecture, both of which are built off of the federal enterprise architecture. So there's a few acronyms in there. But we had somewhere to start. So we started off with educating um, folks that were participating in this uh, effort provided input to the proof of concept uh, exercise around some, some of the technical components there, uh, started to assemble and evaluate information as it related to our as-is technology landscape, and then uh, drafted a 2B vision to support this grant. So we were able to sort of 
take that on a little bit even before the first symposia, partly because there's been so much work around this effort um, uh, before we started. So then after the symposium, uh, as was said earlier, the, the, the paper went up, folks signed up, and it really was uh, terrific to see so many people signing up to participate over the summer in committees. Um, and so we appreciate that across all the committees uh, to help think through this and, and dive into what was started at the symposium in, in more depth. So we ended up, uh, initially we thought we'd meet three times, it ended up being four times uh, as we stepped through different areas and we looked at uh, key architecture elements, uh, fundamental ideas and concepts, looking at what are the high priority processes and capabilities. And so as we start looking through this, part of, part of what you see as you look at these frameworks is there's a lot, because the framework covers all of what we do, and so we can't change and redesign all of what we do at one time, right? So we spent quite a bit of time talking about, well, if we have to start somewhere, not that we're gonna exclude anything, where do we start? Um, and that's that's the priority prioritization piece. Uh, looking at data needs to be shared, um, and as that's been coming up in the other committees as well, uh, recommendations uh, and potential barriers. Um, we did throw out the question, and we'll touch on our, our thoughts later. You know, well, if this seems straightforward, why hasn't it happened yet? Um, and I'll, I'll let you all think about that and see if you came up with the same ideas. Uh, leveraging ongoing and upcoming projects. One of the things around technology, certainly we have a lot underway right now, a lot in the hopper. Uh, and so the question becomes, especially in, in an environment in California uh, where we have very large systems, multi-million dollar efforts, how do you influence that given just the time frames for planning start to finish and all of that? And then areas where support is needed from other committees. So there were several things where we, we got to and said governance is absolutely key. We are going to leave that to the governance committee. Okay, stay focused. <laughs> so um, very much uh, appreciating the interdependency of the committees. And that's what this uh, diagram represents. So um, as we implement technology, technology really is a tool, um, but it's a tool to accomplish all of the things that we've been talking about over the last day and a half. How we, uh, how we support the governance. Depending on how we want to do governance, we can build the technology to help support it and facilitate it. Uh, supporting the legal aspects. We've heard a lot about that this morning, how do we incorporate into the technology the way to track the legal uh, restraints, the security, the audits. Uh, organizational change management, again, how do you communicate, over-communicate, and leverage some of these resources to do that? So outcomes. So this is a, a vision we actually set forth before the, the last symposium, and nobody's really edited, so we're sticking with it so far. Um, but the idea that our 2B architecture will improve the delivery and outcome of health and human services in California. It will be consistent with MIDA, so Medicaid Information Technology Architecture, NISIA, National Human Services Interoperability Architecture, and Related Information Sharing Standards. So one of the themes that you'll hear, though, is, is we really talked a lot about how we use standards, national standards that are in place so that we don't have to recreate the wheel. And that's really part of what the MIDA and NISIA framework are all about. How do we move from the as is to the to be? And what does it mean to do that? And again, it's too hard to take it on all at once. So where do we want to start? And the advantage that we have is that there are these national frameworks that have already been built out. And there's tremendous depth around these. So the, uh, I'll speak some to the MIDA because that's where I'm living and breathing every day uh, today in the Department of Healthcare Services. So the Medicaid Information Technology Architecture, unfortunately people get stuck on the IT in the middle of that and they think of the technology piece, but it really is Medicaid architecture, which is the business architecture, the information architecture, and the technology architecture. There's three big buckets to that. And so actually where I sit is in that information architecture bucket. Um, our CIO, Chris Cruz, sits in the technology bucket, and we have um, our associate director that's sitting with the business bucket to help lead that in the organization. But under the business side, MIDA does a great job. It says there's 10 business areas, 
Under that, there's business functions, and under that, there's 80 business processes. And for each business process, it's called out your start, your stop, your input, your output, the processes that come before, the processes that come after, after the steps of the process, and the measures for the process. So pick your process and you've got somewhere to start. And then with the capabilities matrix that goes with it, it tells you how to measure your advancement along the way and gives you goals. Uh, goals that can go straight into requirements doc documents for procuring IT. A huge tool that we probably haven't really leveraged to the extent that we could and can. Uh, and NISIA provides that same kind of framework as well in terms of, again, how do we talk about what we do in a common way? And when you look at the two frameworks, Medicaid has obviously got a health focus and NISIA has a human services focus. There's a tremendous amount of overlap. So as we put these slides together, um, we sort of used one or the other framework and it didn't really matter because they're talking about the same things. So major to be architecture elements. So again, business it is the lead issue. And really, uh, if we can think about how we do the business differently, the rest will follow. Uh, the information, uh, there's a lot around information management that we can uh, learn and develop. Uh, technology, uh, we have a lot of a good focus around governance. Obviously, we spent quite a bit of time on yesterday, which is key. Uh, and then options for connections to support um, the county and state health information exchange, as well as other kinds of exchanges. So this is a reminder. Um, at the end of the last symposium, this is, these were the things that were called out um, as part of the roadmap around the technology committee which we won't spend much time on because we updated them this summer. Um, so again, a tremendous uh, input from the, the committee members over the summer where we really tried to refine that. So I'm gonna step through each of the recommendations we had and uh, spend a little bit of time on each of these and try to tie them back to the conversations we've had over the last three days. So the first and foremost recommendation and while generally the recommendations are in no particular order, I would say this really is the first and foremost recommendation because it, it echoed throughout the committee conversations, is adopting national standards. Uh, we uh, in California have done a good job of having California specific standards for a wide variety of things. The problem is we work with folks that also work with other states that work with the national level. And so then when we have California specific standards, that means providers, vendors, everybody else has to do something special just for us. And then we have issues. Our systems don't talk. We don't call it the same thing. Interoperability gets really hard uh, because inevitably we have to interact with those other systems. So one of the, the, the big pushes has been around national standards. So as part of uh, the High Tech Act, Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, uh, there really was a, a push towards these national standards and by putting billions of dollars into incentive payments for providers to adopt electronic health records that were to be built on standards. So this is where the money is pushing it. Uh, we do know that when you make a financial investment, it does tip the scales and that's exactly what's happened. Um, and so there's really been a push towards these national standards. There's also huge components right now around adopting ICD-10, which is the International Classification of Diseases. This is how we code and write down diagnoses and charts. Um, the rest of the world went to ICD-10 about a decade ago. The death certificates went to ICD-10 about a decade ago, even here in California. Uh, we are now, as a, a clinical community, moving to ICD-10 from ICD-9, October 2014, coming soon to your neighborhood. It's going to be a major change. In order to ad adapt and use that, we have to change our billing format from a 40-10 to a 50-10, from a previous version to an 837. There's all these components that are really driving us towards these national standards again. Um, and so tremendously transforming the way we do our business and how they interact. So the, the HL7 is a health level seven. Again, this is a framework for how you record clinical information. 
and uh, also has crossover into the human services side as well uh, through these different programs. So again, national standards. We really want to see national standards become step one in the conversation and then we move on to how we're going to build, build from that. The second part that goes hand in hand is this, and this, this is uh, perhaps a strong overlap with governance, is the idea that really, and this kind of le led from part of our question, well, why hasn't it happened yet? Um, we really need leaders to support, support and promote these key concepts. <coughs> Without the leadership support and uh, folks saying, no, this really is where we're going to start. We're, we're gonna skip the whole conversation about that being special and unique, um, and, and it was, you know, great here in New York City say, yes, that, that, that really does create some challenges. The idea is how do we really do it 80% the same? And so how do we start there and having the leadership to really help push that? One of the areas that we've already been doing this, uh, wanted to give, uh, again, a shout out, particularly because the use case we've been uh, looking at in the symposium is around foster care. The California Child Welfare Council uh, had uh, developed a statement of information sharing and data standardization, and this is, I think, over a year old now, um, has also been adopted by the Blue Ribbon Commission and, and calls out very specifically uh, the idea of reuse of information and technology and applications, common frameworks and models, um, and interoperable standards, and things such as NEAM, the National Information Exchange Model, which we've heard about this the last couple days. So again, we already have this momentum building, so we need, how do we keep doing that? And then the third uh, recommendation, which obviously goes along with the other two, consider adopting standards and concepts at every opportunity. So we have lots of opportunities when either systems are changing, shifting, new budget proposals, new program redesign, new grants that we're applying for. How can we make sure we insert this at every single opportunity? So around the timeline, so this is a, a format we use throughout all the recommendations, was we thought in terms of the, the first six months, the six, to two, six months to two years, and more than two years. So really, uh, education outreach is something that we thought for these first three recommendations is really the critical first step. Uh, because uh, most folks probably don't know what NISIA, NEEM, and MIDA are, or what the national frameworks are. Um, and so there's a learning curve, and there's a misconception around them. So they don't seem like friendly things to help advance the business. Um, and, uh, and our technology partners, I think, uh, have done um, a good job. That fits with a lot of the ways they think with swim lanes and, and flow diagrams. Um, but on our programmatic side, we haven't done as much around that. So education and outreach. And then taking a look at where are our active projects that we can uh, engage in, um, looking at how we influence some of the standards in, in terms of how we develop our projects in the state. And then from a longer term perspective, uh, looking at full implementation, making sure that we don't build a system that doesn't use national standards. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And, and one of the things that we heard in this conversation um, in the committee was we heard the same thing from the counties and the state participants um, because, again, county systems need to talk to state systems, need to talk to national systems, need to talk back to the county systems. And the only way to make that happen is if we're, if we're all using the same standards, verbiage, methods, um, then we can have those systems talk to each other. So this was really emphasized across the board. So recommendation four, this is very similar to another set of recommendations that uh, were heard in some of the other committees. Um, so perhaps this is a universal recommendation. Build on lessons learned. Uh, let's, let's not recreate something that's already been done or learned that was being talked about earlier today under the, the legal um, presentation. The idea that there is a tremendous amount of work that's being done and we can learn from each other. One of the things that uh, we did over the summer as part of the committee meetings was we had several uh, kind of mini presentations from some of our county partners who have already been implementing some of these standards and trying it out. So um, as was discussed yesterday, the uh, federal identity management model uh, has been tried out in two of our counties uh, and they have they have real life experience about what it means to try to implement that um, so the idea that we have a lot to learn from each other and how do we make sure in this interoperability space whether it's the the business the legal the change management the governance or the technology we are doing that so the the idea was start with identifying those lessons learned 
document them, and then have a place where we start to really make sure we're applying. So that shared space to, to be able to share those. And, and some of those obviously end up in a somewhat more confidential space. Some of them are in a more public space. And, and, and I think the encouragement would be to say, uh, unless there really is a really strong reason that it absolutely has to be confidential, if, if we had a Public Records Act, would we have to release it? Let's make it public, make it easier to find. Um, because sometimes we create workspaces and we, we just make it harder on ourselves by, by trying to, to get it fully baked. Um, so we know that we're in process, we know that we have things to learn from each other, um, and we need to take a look at how we do that and be clear about what should be in what, what kind of space. Recommendation five, the idea of integrating health and human services enterprise architectures for interoperability. So that's a mouthful. So how many people in here feel comfortable and could stand up and explain enterprise architecture? Excellent. Well, it's more than the two that I thought were going to raise their hand. <laughs> so enterprise architecture uh, is, is basically, it's like drawing the blueprint for the house that you're going to build. You don't really want to start before you've laid out the plan to know that you're going to have the living room here, the bathroom here, the kitchen there. Where do the pipes need to go? Where do the wires need to go? Because you know the last thing you want is your cable connection in the bathroom and your plumbing in the living room, right? Doesn't work out so well. I, don't, yeah. I wouldn't think. So, so the enterprise architecture is really that laying out the blueprint. How are we going to have these pieces talk to each other? And uh, uh, there's, again, a number of frameworks. So we've talked about MIDA and NICIA as a sort of a place to start. And again, federal enterprise architecture is another place to start. But again, enterprise architecture tends to, ha has come out of the IT uh, shop. Um, and so people, again, tend to hear that and think technology. But the idea is it's really about how are our programs going to fit together? When we have a program that is responsible for immunizations and public health, and we have a program that provides healthcare services to children in Department of Healthcare Services, and we have a program in Department of Social Services that takes care of these children that are in foster care. What does it mean for those pieces to interact? How are they going to tie together? Uh, where is the point of intersection? from a programmatic perspective, from a policy perspective, from a data and technology perspective. And so enterprise architecture is about how do we want those pieces to fit together so that the individual can get their immunization record, perhaps, the parent or whoever the guardian is at the time, the provider, um, and then from a population perspective, knowing where have folks been immunized and where haven't they? Where are we at risk of an outbreak because there's under immunization? So enterprise architecture is really about how do we put these bricks together that we call programs, that we call departments, so that they will actually be able to work together and be able to meet that, that I think, vision that we saw um, from New York City this morning. So along those lines, uh, starting off with uh, one example is the CWS new system. Um, there's been a lot of conversation around that in terms of what are the ways that that can help drive this because it is a new system. And, uh, and Sarah's talked about a number of ways that it is, is working to do that. Um, the idea about uh, giving child welfare workers access to information that they need to do their job. Um, what would that look like? How can we accomplish that? Those are things we might want to look at in the short term. In the midterm, looking again, the information security is absolutely critical. Um, one of the things we put up here is this idea of blue button. What that really is is, is a way of uh, enabling a person to see their own information. Um, it's an initiative that's been led by the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, uh, and uh, a number of organizations have adopted that. It started with the Veterans Affairs. Medicare has a blue button, so if you're a Medicare member, you can log on and see all of your claims history um, for yourself. Um, so what would it mean, uh, again, to give people access to their own information, and it's a way of automating that. Identifying data sharing needs um, is another thing. And then in the longer term, again, state and county systems integrating with intrastate health information exchange. So one of the things that I mentioned was, again, the, the Medicaid information technology architecture is a framework. One of the things that it calls out for us is the, uh, one, of, one of our tasks is case management. 
And we've been talking about that. I mean, the, the idea of a psychotropic medication for a foster child is case management, a child with an issue that perhaps needs a, med needs a medication. That is a business process that is described. And one of the things that's called out by CMS is it says, if you want to do this well, the Medicaid agency needs to be able to exchange information with health information exchange within the state. And that gives us a level three out of five. We have to exchange with uh, others within the region to hit a level four and with the, na with the national to hit a level five. And admittedly, between three and five, it's, it's a matter of who your, who your partners are that you're exchanging information about. But the idea is, is that we really do need to be able to exchange information if we're going to support case management in a robust way. And so CMS has called that out. So our primary funder uh, for the Medicaid program uh, has said, this is something that we want to see you do. And more and more in the instructions that we're hearing from them, they're saying, Talk to all of the other departments in your agencies. Find out how you can support this. Um, and we see Medicaid as being more holistic in terms of how we take care of individuals. And we're seeing that in a number of our different programs as we work towards uh, things like the Coordinated Care Initiative uh, that has the duals demonstration where we're coordinating not just uh, physical health, but also mental health, behavioral health, and home support services, and other kinds of services that are really supporting those individuals receiving care. Uh, and in that case, the dual eligibles are those that are eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare. So recommendation seven, this is the idea of looking at, again, all those things that we do. So if you say all the things we do are in the kind of the top nine horizontal, so things like identity and access management, confidentiality and privacy agreements, uh, master person index, um, the next bucket, case portfolio, provider registry, eligibility, determination, enrollment, and then performance management and population health. These are activities that across all of those services that then sit underneath. Um, so health care, public health, mental health, I'm reading sideways and at a distance, adult services, uh, financial assistance, food, nutrition, adoption, foster care, child care, et cetera. So a, a wide range of things, and that's probably not all inclusive. This diagram comes out of the NICIA, the National Human Services Interoperability Architecture. Those categories are almost the same as the business areas in MIDA. So it, it crossed over really well, so we went with this, this one. But the idea is we do these same things across all of these different program areas. And I think that's part of what we were hearing in the, the New York City example this morning as well. Um, and so as a committee, we talked about this and said, well, OK, you can't not do any of these things. Right? We, we've got to be doing something around all these. Sometimes it's a cart and horse question, right? However, if we have to prioritize because we have limited resources, where should we focus some of those extra resources initially? Where, what do we need to go after first? Is there a dependency? And as a committee, we felt that, yes, there is a dependency. So the green items are the things that we really do have to go over after first. And that's, again, the identity and access management. So you saw that in the demo this morning. You are who you say you are, and we've verified that. And because we've verified that, we will give you access to this information. That's identity and access management. So you saw that this morning. Confidentiality and privacy. That, again, was the theme this morning in, in the, the legal conversation. What are you legally allowed to see, and how do we make sure we protect the privacy of the individuals we're caring for? That's absolutely critical in all of this to make sure that we're doing that so that we maintain the trust with those individuals we are, are participating with. The master person index, that's how do I know that Lynette Scott is the Lynette with an L-I and not an L-Y and an E on the end and two T's, right? As opposed to the other Lynette. And then there's actually a few Lynette Scotts out there. So I want you to get me, not that other person that I'm not related to, that I don't know. Um, so Master Person Index is about that. How do you know that you've got the right person? And so that's, again, something else that was talked about earlier today. Uh, the New York City folks talked about that. The idea of having a Master Person Index. And the idea is you can do this in a federated way, so you know that if this is, this is our unique number for each person we're taking care of, and that unique number matches to 
this unique number in the immunization registry, this unique number in Medicaid, this unique number in financial assistance. Um, and so you have your key to help get into those systems to pull the right information. Um, but if you don't have that, you can't get to the next step. So we identified those three things as being the base that we have to build from. And so that's why we made them green and said next six months and we're well aware that we're not gonna get all that done in six months. But it's the early stage. <clears throat> the second bucket around case portfolio provider eligibility and enrollment. So uh, part of the reason for calling out case portfolio in particular is that that was part of this use case that we have for the symposium around uh, the, the Secretary of Meds for Foster Care. Uh, but the other part is, again, you get people into the system. You need to know which providers you're working with. You need to know who you're taking care of. Um, that's, again, step one. And then performance management and population health builds on all of the above. So we did have conversation around, well, you, you, it does help to drive everything if you have good performance measures that are helping to keep that moving. Um, looking at the population health issues helps you target your intervention. So you don't want to not do that until you've solved everything else. But again, it was, it was where can we focus first and what do we need to, to really serve as a base? So part of that then leads into this idea of where might we try to implement this? And, and we looked at this from a couple different directions. So if we, if we know that these are areas we need to focus on, where, where do we start? And so we looked at it from the perspective of what are those high priority information exchanges? Where do we need data to be moving? And that was one of those questions we started off with, right? Um, a follow on to this that we'll get to in the, the next recommendation is also what, what projects are in play that we can leverage? I mean, those are kind of paired. When we talked about this, we decided very quickly there is absolutely no way that we as a committee over the summer can pick the high priority data exchanges that need to be fixed first. And, and I think having the chance to follow Larry's presentation from the legal committee earlier today, um, that highlights that issue as well. But what we did talk about is what are the ways that we can get at that? What are the tools that people have used to help tackle that question? And so part of that um, is this idea around uh, who might be candidates for information sharing. So where, again, sort of like thinking of the New York City example, what are the, the low-hanging fruits, the things that um, people can agree on uh, might need to share? Another is thinking about documenting the process for adopting and implementing uh, the data sharing. So again, I think New York City was a fantastic example of that, that process. How do you pick and choose which data sharing you're going to take on and then work through all those steps? And then another piece, uh, that ki a couple other pieces that came in with that is the idea of, uh, again, having personas to help make it real, the idea of use cases. Um, and we've seen that in the symposium here over the last two days. Uh, to make it real for folks. Who are we trying to take care of? Because then you know what you're trying to solve. When we talk nebulously and say, we really think it would be important to link vital record data with Medicaid data. OK, so why? What does it matter? Um, there's lots of reasons it matters. But if I just say I want to link vital records and Medicaid data, that doesn't sell it for you, right? Like, OK. Whatever, right? Well, as it turns out, there's a whole bunch of these business processes that, that tie into it. So things like understanding that the, the birth record may have information about the delivery and the family environment um, as to whether the, the father was named on the birth record, the educational level of the mother, um, race ethnicity information, uh, a variety of things that are collected on the birth certificate and don't exist in the Medicaid record that will help us understand that child. Uh, the death certificates also come into play when we look at uh, from a fraud and abuse perspective because that is one of our responsibilities from an accountability perspective, um, making sure that um, when somebody is deceased that they are then removed from the system and somebody hasn't stolen their identity and is taking access. So there's a, there, there's a wide variety of, of, of reasons. Um, but, but to just say we need to get these data systems to talk to each other is not enough. We really need to understand it. So the idea of using personas and use cases is really important. Um, and, and whatever that thing is that's driving you and dri makes that use case sit on the top is probably where we will start. Um, the other aspect is having, again, that leadership to help drive it. 
And so one of the reasons um, that uh, we have in this interoperability discussion, the foster care use case and the psychotropic medications for foster care use case um, being highlighted here is for just that reason. It is something that there's a lot of energy around in the state of California. We've been working on this through the Child Welfare Council, through the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of energy and effort. We have quality improvement projects between social services and healthcare services around this issue. Um, there's a huge recognition of it from a national level that there's a lot more use of psychotropic medications in foster children than other children. Um, so there's a lot of energy. So that's why we picked this use case for this interoperability conversation. But interoperability is much more than this use case, right? So as we think about where are the other priority areas for data sharing, that kind of conversation will feed into it. And depending on where we sit, there may be different drivers. Um, so again, as we look at the, the further out piece, building on lessons learned, um, Identifying the next steps, where do we go after step one, the next data that might be shareable. Uh, testing the process and adopting uh, a standard dictionary. The idea around a standard dictionary goes to, again, standards. Um, one of the things that was discussed yesterday in the conversation, uh, the National Information Exchange model, we have disparate systems, mainframes, large systems, multi-million dollar systems. They're not going to change right away. But what is it we need to connect in between? Um, and that's being done in a lot of parts of the country, the lightweight connectors that sit on top of these systems and help make them connect. And part of that is having a really good um, understanding of uh, what it, are the definitions of the data that sit in those systems so you know how to crosswalk. So that is, is it first name, last name? Uh, is it race, ethnicity in one category? Is race one category? Is ethnicity another category? How is that captured and coded? Those are things that refer to this, this idea of data dictionary, and that feeds into then the ability to do those connections on top. Um, because the big systems are huge. Um, they've been here for decades. They'll be here for decades. When we start one, it takes quite a while to change it. It's not a short-term process. However, how do we s have something sit on top and connect? And that's some of what you saw demonstrated in these different proof of concepts is really it was something that sits on top of our existing systems and helps connect and create that interchange and that interface um, without rebuilding the system that sits underneath. Um, and, then, and then the governance process, having that mature. And then recommendation nine, uh, again, continuing collaboration among our organizations that support health and human services across the state and counties to further interoperability. So everybody's been really excited about the work that's happened as part of the symposium. I think we've all been very much energized that this is something that we can do. Admittedly, it gets overwhelming really quickly, but we'll have to find the pieces where we have that success and we can move it forward uh, to keep ourselves energized. Um, and so that's part of this idea around looking at, at how we enlist sponsors, we move support forward, um, establishing a forum, how, how we coordinate. Um, so I think that's been called out in all of the committees. Uh, so obviously this grant is going to end, um, and part of the deliverable of this grant is producing a plan, which is what we're going to spend the afternoon working on and diving into more detail on. Um, but a key part of that plan is going to be calling out what do we need to do to, to go next? How do we keep this moving? What are the, the pieces that work for your program areas, the pieces that are missing that we need to add? And we're going to ask you those kinds of questions. Uh, but, but it's clear that we need, we need a space. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, you know, as, as New York City presented earlier, um, yeah, it, I didn't get to ask the actual question, but it sounded like they have a unit that's probably responsible organizationally for the HHS Connect. So one of the things that we probably in California will want to be thinking about is what that looks like. And I know there's lots of conversations going on. Um, so, but understanding that it really does take a focus. And this grant has demonstrated that when you have that focus, there is a lot that we can get done. Um, but how are we going to keep doing it? And so that builds on this next piece that we really do think it needs to keep going. So, uh, so, so those were our nine recommendations, echoed a lot of what we heard in all of the other committees. Um, we did spend a little bit of time at, at, as we were closing out our committee work, sort of asking this question, well, okay, so why haven't we already done this? I mean, it seems sort of straightforward. 
it didn't seem like we were coming up with newer revolutionary ideas. We put them all together. Um, but why hasn't this happened? And so, um, so we spent some time talking about you know, things that have been covered over the last day and a half. Culture. What is the culture? Where is our cultural base um, around these kinds of issues? Uh, what are our priorities? Um, over time, priorities shift. Some days it's, it's one thing, another day it might be another. We spend a lot of time in crisis management in, in government, uh, depending on what the, the issue of the day is. Uh, but how are we setting our priorities? Uh, funding and contracting. Uh, this was another piece that was really identified from the technology perspective. One of our challenges around interoperability is that when we enter into contracts with vendors for a system, we often don't include in the contract the fact that we plan to reuse components of the system. So then we get locked in because of the way we've written the contract that we then cannot reuse components of the system even though we have folks like CMS saying, we've already paid for it. Why do you want to pay for it again? Well, the contract doesn't necessarily allow. Um, and so that's something we've run into in terms of the way we've done our contracting in the past. In the past, funding stream said, no, we're paying for this, and we will not share our funding with that funding source. And no, you can't commingle funding sources and actually build something that makes sense. That's also part of our history, right? You know, why did we get here? Well, that's how we got here. The contrast to that, though, is that now our funders are saying, get together. We're only going to pay for our part of it. Build it once. We don't want to pay for the whole thing. We only want to pay for parts. So find out who else needs it and get together. So, so our federal funders are changing the game, and they are dictating to us that we need to figure this out. And since they're one of our big funders, we, we definitely want to be working on that. Um, Privacy and security, we you know, had a lot of conversation on that earlier. Um, I think one of the things sort of as was highlighted uh, with the, the proof of concept that we had right before this from IBM, uh, security has come a long way. Security and technology has come a long way. Uh, just because something's on paper doesn't make it more secure. It means it's harder to track. It means it's you know, perhaps less data in one spot. It's heavier to carry a big box. Um, but it's harder, too, to put audit controls on it, to be able to truly track it, unless you've barcoded it and you have a you know, scanner, like they, they have on the books at the bookstore so you don't walk out with it, right? But we don't do that with all of our documents. So, so just because it's paper doesn't mean it's more secure. And actually, a lot of what's happened on the technology side is, is introduced a tremendous amount of security, auditability, um, and reporting in the, in the technology base. And so how do we really uh, take advantage of that to then make sure that we are ensuring privacy and confidentiality? Um, and then leadership. Uh, again, that theme around governance, how this all comes together, and the leadership piece. And I think um, under this grant, we've seen a tremendous amount of leadership. It has been a privilege to work with Shell and Gretchen and their teams. So happy that you got this grant. Um, and, and that there's a lot that we have to carry forward here. Um, and I think we see that by everybody being here in this room, from our counties, from the state, from across the different communities. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of leadership here in this room. And so we are all, uh, to cite Shell's example, to be the heroes in the movie, to take this leadership piece forward and then carry the message. So the idea of leveraging upcoming and ongoing IT initiatives. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these. these are a this is a list that we compile compiled from a state and county perspective that highlights some of the kinds of things that are currently in process that may be able to um, be either lessons learned or potentially leveraged uh, as we move forward. And as you can see, there's as many county examples as there are state examples, if not more. Um, so there are lots of opportunities uh, in terms of how we really incorporate these activities uh, together. Um, lots of ways that we can leverage the technology, leverage the work that's been done. Um, and so I would encourage us as we move into this afternoon, uh, while it is um, hard sometimes not to be overwhelmed, uh, let, let's find those parts that we can really tackle. And again, we're not trying to solve the whole thing. We're trying to figure out what we can solve in the near term um, so that we can move the bar further down the line. 
So what we highlighted here from our, our set of recommendations uh, in terms of next steps, these were the things that we called out in that first six months. Um, again, recognizing that it may take it more than six months, but the highest priority items. So again, education and outreach, focusing on the foundational capabilities, so identity management uh, and access control, confidentiality and privacy, and master person index. Continuing the collaboration, building on lessons learned, and gaining executive buy-in.